Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to carry on with the next part. Uh, hopefully, this will be the final. Uh, about 11 pages to go of this uh, motion from October the 11th. That's when it when, when it was written, October the 11th of uh, 2019, and obviously it arrived with the uh, Manitowoc on the 15th. The Manitowoc Court on the 15th. I think I've got that bit right. Hello, Anthony. Hi. How you doing? Hope. Hope you've had a a good day, morning, afternoon, or maybe you're you're into this evening, as we are here in Gala. It's pitch black outside. Half six in the evening. Good evening, Paul Ward. Okay, so here's the next bit, or should, what should be the final part of the Zellner motion. That looks pretty good to me. So here we go with the uh, the paragraph we left at was as follows. Quote, none of these issues were addressed by the circuit court in its original order to dismiss Steve's motion, nor could they, given that all of them were based on the discovery of new evidence that was either withheld from Steve or, through no fault of his own, was not in Steve's possession at the time he filed his post-conviction motions. So, and uh, hi there, dark side. The next uh, section, the circuit court, um, Angela, Super Witch abused her discretion in ignoring the subsequent briefs submitted by the parties incident to the motion to supplement. On June 7th, 2018, the appellate court ordered that, quote, this appeal is remanded forthwith to the circuit court to permit Steve to pursue a supplemental post-conviction motion in connection with Steve's receipt of previously withheld dis discovery or other new information. I think that's interesting, you know, that the appellate court is recognizing the fact that it's previously withheld discovery or new information. The circuit court ignored this court's specific order to allow the inclusion of new information in the motion to supplement on september the 6th 2018 so that's a year before this was written the circuit court ruled quote, nowhere in the very specific orders of the court of appeals did the court allow for a reply brief by the state or a response by the defendant because the Court of Appeals was so detailed in its instructions, the court did not consider the subsequent briefs submitted by the parties after the defendant's court-ordered filing. This court followed the order of the Court of Appeals and only considered the initial brief of the defendant. Steve filed a motion to compel for production of the examination of the Dasi Yander computer that was performed over an eighth an eighth month an eight month time period in 2017 to 2018 the circuit court never ruled on steve's motion to compel current post-conviction counsel obtained an affidavit from barb on august the 2nd 2018 wherein she described investigator dedoing investigator dealing of Calumet County Sheriff's Department, telling her, you should not give the computer to Kathleen Zellner. Why not? One wonders. The circuit court never ruled on current post-conviction counsel's motion to compel or whether the computer would be tendered to current post-conviction counsel. In fact, Barb voluntarily 
turned the computer over to current post-conviction counsel and after a careful forensic examination of the computer data by Mr. Gary Hunt concluded that there were quote massive image deletions that would render any new forensic examination meaningless. Current post-conviction counsel's computer forensic expert Gary Hunt was unable to determine when the massive deletions occurred, leaving open the possibility that law enforcement themselves were responsible for the deletions. Because the circuit court denied a hearing, the issues of the deletions remain unresolved. 10. The circuit court erred in denying Steve's supplemental motion for post-conviction relief pursuant to 97406 concerning the discovery of human bones in the Manitowoc County gravel pit before trial. It is well settled that this court reviews the denial of a statute 97406 motion using a mixed standard of review. First, we determine whether the motion on its face alleges sufficient material facts that, if true, would entitle the defendant to relief. This is a question of law that we review de novo. If the motion raises such facts, the circuit court must hold an evidentiary hearing. We review a circuit court's discretionary decisions under the deferential erroneous exercise of discretion standard. State versus Allen. Now, on February the 25th of 2019, the appellate court granted post-conviction counsel's motion to supplement the record on appeal with an undisclosed police report and allowed current post-conviction counsel to file a supplemental post-conviction motion. The appellate court further remanded the appeal to the circuit court to, quote, conduct any proceedings necessary to address the claims raised in the supplemental post-conviction motion and to enter an order containing its findings and conclusions. On August the 9th, 2019, the circuit court entered an order, but without conducting any further proceedings denying Steve's supplemental 97406 motion. Steve's motion alleged claims for relief in connection with the state's violation of Wisconsin statute 968205, the evidence preservation statute and the violation of his due process rights due to preservation of evidence as protected by Youngblood versus Arizona. First, Steve's 97406 motion alleged sufficient material facts that, if true, would entitle Steve to relief. This court reviews Steve's claim of error de novo. Steve is entitled to an evidentiary hearing on both his Wisconsin statute 968205 and constitutional rights claims because evidence establishing that human remains were recovered from a location other than Steve's property refutes the state's theory that all of the human remains were recovered from a location under Steve's exclusive control. Indeed, if Teresa's remains were actually in the gravel pit, then the defense would have been able to substantiate and not just speculate about an alternative theory that someone other than Stephen Avery murdered Teresa and moved her bones to Steve's burn pit 
to frame him. Now, in order to successfully convict Steve, the state presented a false, false forensic story to the jury, which claimed that the bones in the gravel pit were, quote, not evidence because they were not human and therefore could not have been Teresa's. And yet they conspired to hand them back to the Holbach family. The issue on remand to the circuit court was whether the state violated Youngblood and Wisconsin Statute 968205 when it returned the human bones to the Holbach family in 2011 without giving notice to Steve or his counsel. Steve's supplemental 97406 motion alleged material facts sufficient to establish a violation of the Wisconsin Evidence President Statute, Preservation, in fact, not President, Preservation Statute, Wisconsin Statute 968205 and Youngblood. Of course, this Evidence Preservation Statute, authored by none other than Norm Garn. Now, because 968205 does not provide a remedy for convicted persons in the event of a violation, because it's never happened before, fashioning a remedy is left to the courts, an action Wisconsin courts have yet to take. They've never had this happen before. Or at least they've never been caught. Steve Supplemental 968205 motion contained sufficient material facts for the circuit court to fashion a remedy for such evidence preservation violations controlled by United States Supreme Court precedent addressing evidence preservation violations. See Trombetta and Youngblood. Taken together, Trombetta and Youngblood comprise the line of constitutional jurisprudence that outlines the extent of the state's duty to preserve evidence. Quote, and sorry, no, um, citing, let's see, Youngblood and Trombetta. While the Trombetta test focuses on the probative value of the destroyed evidence and whether the evidence possessed exculpatory value that was apparent before its destruction. The Youngblood test examines, examines the government's role in the circumstances that led to the destruction of the evidence. If a criminal defendant can satisfy either test, then a court will rule the destruction of evidence was a violation of due process and reverse and reverse, just straightforward, reverse the defendant's conviction. The due process clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution imposes a duty on the state to preserve exculpatory evidence. State versus Greenwald. The state's failure to preserve evidence violates a defendant's due process rights if police, one, fail to preserve evidence that is obviously exculpatory, or two, acted in bad faith by failing to preserve evidence that is potentially exculpatory. I don't think there can be any question about the acted in bad faith when the person that actually wrote part of the statute gets together with the assistant attorney general together with uh, who at the time uh, lieutenant Weigert, but now the current sheriff of calumet county and they deliberately did it secretly giving back the bones that sukovic is saying they're not even human The circuit court, Sukhrich, mistakenly found that the evidence destroyed by the state through the Calumet County Sheriff's Department and prosecutors Garn, Norm Garn, Robot Voice, 
and Thomas Fallon creator face was not material because it was not human. The circuit court's findings reveals that failure of the court to acknowledge and understand the Leslie Eisenberg reports provided to the court by Stephen Avery. Materiality. The applicability of either Trombetta or Youngblood depends upon the materiality of the evidence that was lost or destroyed. A hurdle to applying these tests is the difficulty of definitely knowing the material value of evidence that no longer exists. However, in the context of addressing the materiality of evidence lost or destroyed in violation of Wisconsin Statute 968205, the Wisconsin legislature has already resolved that problem, especially when considered together with 97407, the DNA Evidence Preservation Statute demonstrates the Wisconsin legislature's recognition, recognition of the importance of post-conviction DNA testing. These statutes taken together provide for the preservation of biological evidence and, in many instances, subsequent DNA analysis. The codified right to DNA preservation and testing shows the legislative intent to ensure that DNA testing of biological evidence plays, quote, a significant role in the suspect's defense and efforts to obtain post-conviction relief. Therefore, the Wisconsin legislator, through the DNA preservation statute, has placed preserved biological evidence in the class of evidence the United States Supreme Court deemed material as defined in Trombetta and Youngblood. B. Potentially exculpatory evidence preserved under Wisconsin statute 968205. Second, following from this presumption of materiality, the DNA evidence preservation statutes further presume that, in every case, biological evidence collected in the course of a criminal investigation is at least potentially exculpatory as defined in Greenwald. In the context of DNA evidence, apparently exculpatory evidence includes instances where results from testing or retesting of biological evidence that excluded the petitioner would exonerate him or her of the crime of conviction. see national com on the future of dna evidence usa department of justice post-conviction dna testing recommendations for handling requests number four okay similarly potentially exculpatory dna evidence refers to evidence in cases where if subjected to dna testing or retesting exclusionary result exclusionary results would support the petitioner's claim of innocence. In line with the Supreme Court's reasoning in Youngblood, this category includes evidence that was simply an avenue of investigation that might have led in any number of directions and evidence about which no more can be said than that it could have been subjected to tests, the results of which might have exonerated the defendant. These categorical requirements for potentially exculp exculpatory evidence necessarily apply to biological evidence covered by the DNA evidence preservation statute because preserved evidence test results allow reasonable persons to disagree as to whether the results of DNA testing rule out the possibility of guilt or raise a reasonable doubt of guilt. Therefore, evidence covered under the Biological Evidence Preservation Statute must be deemed at least potentially exculpatory and the loss or destruction of such evidence triggers at minimum 
the Youngblood due process analysis. The DNA evidence preservation statute presumes that every violation constitutes bad faith. The Youngblood court reasoned that law enforcement actions suggesting bad faith arose when the police themselves by their conduct indicate that the evidence could form a basis for exonerating the defendant. This consideration in turn hinges on the police's knowledge of the exculpatory value of the evidence at the time it was lost or destroyed. In these cases, bad faith exists when the conduct of the police is outside the scope of normal practice. The Youngblood's court's definition of bad faith takes for granted that there are times when the police will not know whether evidence was material before its loss or destruction. The DNA preservation statute eliminates this assumption by creating an affirmative duty to preserve all biological evidence taken from the crime scene. Therefore, law enforcement ages, agencies are on notice that biological evidence is deemed important to the successful administration of criminal justice and may not claim ignorance that the destroyed evidence was at least potentially exculpatory. Well, of course, we know that the original report, Calumet County report, that was given to Kathleen Zellner omitted the last two pages that dealt with the handing back of the bones. They knew exactly what they were doing when they handed over that report to, I believe it was uh, one of um, Kathleen Zellner's uh, investigators, whose name escapes me at the moment. I'll come back. Anyway, carrying on. Statute 968205 imposes certain duties upon law enforcement agencies. At the most basic level, the state bears a duty to preserve all biological evidence collected during the course of an investigation that leads to a conviction. Additionally, the statute sets forth the steps the state must take before lawfully destroying such evidence in its possession. Because a violation of the DNA preservation statute means the state did not abide by either the requirements for preservation or the proper destruction of the evidence as required by law, such conduct constitutes bad faith. Youngblood, potentially exculpatory, combined with bad faith, requirement is met. Under the Youngblood test, courts would examine whether the evidence was potentially exculpatory, and if so, whether the police acted in bad faith when they destroyed the evidence. In light of the presumptions created by the DNA evidence preservation statute, the trial stipulation, the trial, the pre-trial FBI examination, and the April 4th, 2007 order mandates that the evidence be considered potentially exculpatory. As set forth above, the presence of bad faith should be presumed every time that Wisconsin statute 968205 DNA evidence preservation statute is violated. Here, the failure to give notice to Steve and his attorneys violated the statute and constituted bad faith, as did returning the gravel pit bones to the Holbach family in violation of Wisconsin Statute 968205 and the April 4, 2007 trial court order. The state cannot credibly argue that it returned animal bones to the Holbach family for burial or cremation. Based on the foregoing, 
Mr. Avery set forth sufficient material facts pertaining to the destruction of apparently exculpatory or potentially exculpatory human bone fragments to warrant an evidentiary hearing. Despite the circuit court's erroneous ruling to the contrary, Steve is entitled to such a hearing on his claims because the material facts he alleged in his supplemental 9746 motion, i.e. the who, what, when, where, why and how, are sufficient to show that he is entitled to relief. Second, the circuit court erred when it found that Steve's motion did not on its face state material facts that, if true, would entitle him to relief. This court reviews the circuit court's decision to deny Steve's supplemental 97406 motion without a hearing under the deferential erroneous exercise of discretional standard. The circuit court failed to analyze the sufficiency of the material facts he alleged in his motion. Instead, the circuit court denied Steve's claims by blatantly misstating the evidence in the record. Specifically, the circuit court erred in concluding that the Manitrop County gravel pit bones were non-human when, in fact, the Manitrop quarry bones were labelled as human by Leslie Eisenberg in her reports describing property tag numbers 7411, calcine human bone fragments, nine, uh, 7412, human and non-human bone, 5 of 13 burned calcined with cut edges. Most bone fragments are all cut bone fragments are human. 7413, one burned human fragment. 7414, burned calcined human bone fragments. 7416, human bone fragments. Human is calcined with one cut edge. And 7419, cut burned human bone. The circuit court appears to have ignored the key report of Leslie Eisenberg which is clearly referenced in paragraph 14 of Steve's 968205 Youngblood motion. As stated in paragraph 14 of Steve's motion, Leslie Eisenberg's critical report is attached to Steve's December 17, 28 motion. Inexplicably, maybe maybe not so inexplicably when you consider the shenanigans being pulled so inexplicit inexplicit inexplicably <laughs> and although steve supplied all of the relevant property inventory item numbers for the gravel pit bones relevant to his claim the circuit court reviewed dr eisenberg's trial testimony which only addressed 8765 and dismissed Steve's claim based solely on that testimony. Steve has never contended and does not contend now that item 8675 contained bones determined by Dr. Eisenberg to be human. Dr. Eisenberg testified at trial consistently with her forensic anthropology report that H765 contained only suspected human pelvic bones. As noted above, Steve had an agreement with the state to test this item as part of the agreement reached between the parties in September the 18th, 2017. By completely ignoring the relevant Eisenberg report, the circuit court abused its discretion by concluding that Leslie was testifying about all the gravel pit bones. Leslie was only referring to the pelvic bones that were labelled 8675. At no time did Leslie Eisenberg testify at trial about her other report, which identified numerous gravel bones as being human. All of these bones 
were returned to the Holbach family for burial, burial or cremation. Because the circuit court's analysis of Steve's claim related to Leslie's findings was so deeply flawed, the trial court erroneously exercised its discretion. If the circuit court had granted an evidentiary hearing, the single but fatal mistake would have never occurred. Therefore, the circuit court's order denying Steve's supplemental 97406 motion without an evidentiary hearing must be reversed. And finally, we got there in the end. For the reasons stated herein, Stephen Avery, Stephen Avery respectfully requests that this court grant him one of the following alternative remedies. One, reverse the orders denying post-conviction relief and remand for the state to file a response to the motion for post-conviction relief. In other words, start trying to make up some, uh, some, some answers to some questions. That would be fun reading that and or grant an evidentiary hearing Two, reverse the judgments of conviction and the orders denying post conviction relief and simply remand for a new trial. And as I say, this was dated 11th of October 2019. So uh, that was, as I say, a few days later that it eventually arrived at received on the 14th, three days later, by the Clerk of Court of Appeals, wherever that is. As I say, that was the, uh, that was the last little bit. There's nothing else to add. Yeah, we've just got uh, signatures of, of uh, Kathleen Zellner and Steve Richards. Okay, um, as I say, I've got uh, a whole lot more stuff to go through. Um, you know, in actual fact, this case has been remanded back to Sukovic twice. Um, and, and finally, it's, it's now at the moment out of uh, Angie's hands. But if... Uh, if the circuit court, if the court of appeals so decides, it could be remanded back again. And the state, you know, having to answer what, uh, uh, what the hell they were doing in handing back the bones. As I say, that would be very interesting reading. Um, let's hope that the circuit court, the, sorry, the court of appeals simply does the right thing and says, look, this has to be um, clearly, clearly Kathleen Zellner has shown how obstructive, just how deliberately obstructive Angela has been in this. And take take the take the opinion that, you know, she they are the circuit court, Angie and her cronies are simply trying to give Kathleen Zellner the runaround. And it's time to put an end to this um, and, and do the right thing. And just order a new trial let's let's hope you know let's be positive i'm always a, a glass half full type of person um so tomorrow um tomorrow first thing in the morning uh certainly um well evening time for the aussies but uh, if mill billy is able to join us around about five to five or six oh no the cut clocks go back in wisconsin as well so yes i think you get an extra hour Oh, oh, you did. You did. If you were in uh, in Wisconsin um, or Central Time or whatever time you are, I think the clocks went back yesterday. So, uh, so we're back to uh, our normal um, normal times. So, hopefully, tomorrow we'll have a, a wee chat with uh, Doctor Stiltman. I've got some questions for him as usual, um, and Mill Billy, and maybe Mark as well. Or Let's hope we can uh, we can get them all to uh, come and have a chat. Uh, and I say, I got some questions for them. Um, and as I say, I know exactly what what I want to have a have a look at next. So uh, anyway, we'll uh, we'll see you all soon. Bye for now.
Uh, oh, well, sorry, just before we go, uh, thanks thanks to everybody who's uh, who's tuned in. Dark Side, Alice, Bob Bailey, Joey's, Des, uh, Deborah, Paul Ward. Yeah, thank you all for uh, Jazz Naz. Yep, thank you all for popping along. TTM Fangirl. Colette and Becca. Excellent. Well, it's great to see you all here. Um, right, okay. Uh, we'll catch you all again soon. Take care. Bye for now.